Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Santiago Diaz. Um, this is a, a case study. Uh, it's a material that I'm beginning to use for teaching computational design to younger architects across Perkins and Will. <clears throat> and uh, mostly my, my occupation involves designing. It involves getting into projects, working on a very specific problem, and uh, when, I'm, when I'm finished, I move on to the next project. But lately, there's been an increase in demand or need for computational skills in projects. I don't want to get too much into where the demand comes from because I only have half an hour to go through this, but if you're interested, remind me and ask the question at the end of the presentation. So the case study is about a local project. It's on the main campus of the University of British Columbia. I actually presented this project a couple years back in, in CanBIM. This is going to be a bit of a different spin on the same project. Uh, the, the project is a student accommodation, student residences. Uh, it accommodates roughly 1,000 students. They're all international students. Uh, three quarters of the program of the, uh, of the project is for the residences, and the other 25% is for some uh, admin space, offices, and, and common space. There's a specific scope that I'll be describing or sharing, sharing with you, which is the cladding or the skin of the two towers in this project. So that's where the computation was used. So the image on the, image on the left is a recent photo. The project is well under construction. I believe it's opening later this year. And the image on the right is a representation of some of the information that was processed using computation in this project. The, the requirement for computation came from partly uh, uh, um, a request from our client, UBC Properties Trust, for to reuse a system that was developed on a recent project on the same campus. It was the Ponderosa project. They used uh, insulated, sandwiched, precast concrete panels as their cladding system. Uh, we're, we're located downtown uh, today in, in the Savants, and you'll see when you walk out of the hotel, or if you can remember, most of the buildings that surround us are all glass. And that's what we're used to here in, in Vancouver. It's a very glassy uh, architectural expression for high-density areas. In the uh, UBC, there's a, there's a quest for higher sustainability performance. And that inevitably means that you can't build all glass towers. They, there has to be a significant opaque proportion, portion to the skin of the towers. So the solution was for to use these precast concrete panels for to bring in that opacity. But the client also wanted the project to have a unique image and not look exactly the same or, or resemble in any way the project that the system was used in the past. So just a little bit about this system. Um, uh, this is just a few, uh, an, um, uh, a description on the steps for installing the panels. They're brought in in groups of uh, 12 or 14 on an A-frame on a truck. Then they get removed temporarily from the truck, uh, from the A-frame for to have rods connected into it. Those rods will be used for installation when they're in their final position. Then they get connected onto a crane, lifted into place, and once they're in their final location, there's an installation crew that receives it and makes the final connections. You can see from the interior photo that the panels have a rectangular shape so that they can fit neatly uh, with the uh, window walls. But from the exterior, they have these irregular trapezoidal shapes, which were part of the architectural party. So one of the reasons why the panels were uh, used was because they had proven to be very efficient in their installation on that previous project. And this is a graph or chart showing the pro progress of installing panels in the Orchard Commons project. The, I don't have numbers there, but the height of each bar represents the quantity of panels installed each day, uh, the, the most being 24 panels per day. And the chart is it's a little awkward because I want to show it in, in 3D, but it, you start at the top right, and that's the first week and there's it's, uh, s seven columns because seven days in a week. The weeks here are shown starting on Saturdays. And you'll see that the, 
the, the installation um, company, uh, Right Tech, initially negotiated for to have the crane for four days a week. But very quickly they realized that the installation was happening too quickly. It was, it was too efficient as a system. Um, it was being erected twice as fast as the pouring of the concrete slabs on the towers. So they reduced it to just the weekend and they worked on the weekend, Saturdays and Sundays for a while until the pouring of the, of the North Tower concrete slabs was finished and they, the, the contractor, Stuart Olson, didn't need the crane as often and so then they decided to let's stop working on Sundays. So they worked mostly on Saturdays, sometimes Sundays, but there was some uh, more flexibility of crane usage week by week. By the way, the data that is shown, represented here in this chart, is collected by a team of researchers from UBC who work under Cheryl, who was here earlier today on a panel, and they are, um, in a much more rigorous uh, method, they are tracking the, the performance of construction for the panels for this project, and they're also observing what the impact of computation was in this endeavor. So just a few facts, what were we given as information for the project? Well, we got a brief from the client and we were given a series of design principles. But this is, you know, they're very broad stroke pieces of knowledge or information that we had that we could use as guidance, but certainly not enough information for to understand what worked best for the project. We, all, we were also given a program and here the, the program elements are laid out as colored rectangles indicating in scale the size of each of the program elements and they're drawn in scale in comparison to the site which is shown, the perimeter of the site is shown there in, in plan. This is all very important information but doesn't set a direction for what the design must be. <clears throat> so I'm going to pause here for a moment and uh, talk about um, the difference between design as a way of thinking and computer programming as a way of thinking and computational design as a way of thinking. So I, I phrased it as Design is a paradigm. And I, what I mean by this is that uh, designing does not involve going through a series of uh, standard steps, step by step in a procedural way from start to finish, um, because every time it's different. Instead, design is uh, um, a lens through which a person views the world. It, you develop this, uh, your own sensitivities towards the world. You notice certain things. You, you develop a, an awareness uh, that is um, um, specific of, of, of designers. And uh, one example that I can give you, maybe not in, in architecture, but instead in uh, structures, I worked once with a young engineer uh, who had recently graduated from, from UBC, I believe. And I, asked, I was asking him about how he learned statics and, and the analysis of structural systems. And in our conversation, it was a very candid conversation, and he said, you know, this one time I felt like I got something fundamental, and when I started walking down the streets, you know, in my neighborhood or downtown, I couldn't help but think when I, when I saw a post with a sign cantilever, cantilevered off of it, I couldn't help but see the, the vectors, colored vectors, and kind of the free-floating free floating, uh, force diagrams that, that, are, that exist, that, that represent or describe what's happening there structurally. It's like he was seeing the matrix. And he, he went on and on about different examples of how he, he couldn't help but notice these things. It's, it was a really a new lens that he was looking at the world. It's like these concepts, that these underlying concepts of structural design uh, got to a point that it, so to speak, created a new, um, um, new um, um, neural synapses in his brain that he could not ignore anymore. He could turn it on and off perhaps and kind of look at something in a different way, but he had a, obtained legitimately a new lens to look at the world. So design is similar. You, when you get to a certain point, you look at the world in a, in a different way. And each one of us designers look at the, at the world in our own unique way. So when we're working on projects and there's multiple people working together, we leverage this diversity of perspective in designers, and in the case of Orchard Commons, here's one example, where you take uh, various members of a team and you ask each one of them, you know, we're exploring different massing options for the projects. How about each one of you come up with some options, some alternatives? And there is this unique richness in taking different alternatives by different people and comparing them side by side, because in the comparison, when you put them one next to another, you learn new things 
uh, you learn important lessons or characteristics about each of the alternatives that you might not have discovered if you looked at these alternatives um, individually. And this is the massing that we ended up with because we had a, a significant portion of open public space that required direct uh, access of uh, daylight and we had over 40,000 uh, square meters of program that had to fit on that site. We ended up with two towers uh, with the open space and then we had these uh, podiums that are, uh, the blue part is Vantage College which is a college for the one year stay for those international students. They have an intense program for, to welcome them to the country. And they have, and the green part of the podium are these other um, common spaces of dining hall and, and whatnot. So now let's talk about computational design as a paradigm. It's a different paradigm. It, it's not the same lens as design. There are different things that you are aware to, uh, of. And it's not the same as computer programming. Computer programming is its own paradigm, um, but it shares some common elements between computer programming and also with design. There is, it's a, it, it should be described as a hybrid discipline in my experience. So in this paradigm, when you're working computationally and you have a design and you want to, you know that you're going to, you're at the onset of a, of a reiterative process of exploring how do we make this design real or are there any real concerns that we have to solve? Do we need to optimize it? Do we need to refine it? Perhaps we're not there, we need to continue exploring. If you, if you perceive the need for a computational model, and I'll talk a bit more about this later on, of how you, how you notice a computational problem when you're in front of it. Um, there are certain questions that a computational designer will ask. You need to frame the problem in a way that, can, that is conducive of taking the problem and the possible solutions that will come from it into a computational format. So one of, there are many ways of doing this, but one of the most effective ways that I've found in the past was for to use what I've learned uh, are these yet statements. They're taking two different requirements of the projects that, are, that seem to be very difficult to reconcile. They're, they're um, mutually exclusive. If you obtain the one, you inherently don't obtain the other. So in this case, there were three, on the onset, there were three very obvious um, yet statements that you could make. The first is that, as I mentioned, the project required a high thermal performance, so a 60-40 split, 60% 60 opaque and 40% transparent. The project requires that for the towers. However, it also requires a light appearance. We want it to not be an overbearing, gigantic mass on the site, but it instead have uh, a, um, a lighter expression, which is a bit of an abstract term in architecture, but if you ask an architect, they'll know what that means. Um, but it's difficult to consolidate these two, because inherently when you add opacity, you're taking away lightness. Uh, another requirement is that the client wanted us to use uh, the existing precast system. However, they also wanted us to make it look original. So how do you take a system that was used for a building that's only a few blocks away and it's a recent precedent? You take that system and now make something that is, has its own character, has its own identity. And the third one is that there is a perceived need for to use geometric variation for visual interest. And what that means is instead of patterning a series of rectangles for the, for the windows of the, of the residences, we wanted to shake it up a bit, make it bring some diversity into, into the facade. But how, how do you do that without introducing cost to the project? So we needed to keep the cost of the, of the skin at the range of $40 per square foot. How do you do that, but at the same time introduce this variation? So these are difficult to reconcile, that the answers to these statements are not obvious. Um, after some, what I, would, what I like calling diffuse mode thinking, where you kind of step back, you're either sleeping or you're walking or you're resting, and, you're, you're moving away from your focus mode way of thinking. I, I'm borrowing these terms from Barbara Oakley's book, uh, A Mind for Numbers. She, she explains in a brilliant way how uh, our minds generally, uh, when we're learning new things, we're moving between a diffuse mode of thinking where it's more creative and a focus mode of thinking where we're concentrating, putting our full attention on a problem that we're trying to solve. So this is more of like the diffuse mode way of thinking where you kind of step back from the problem and after a while you come up with uh, something that that resonates. 
but it doesn't necessarily consolidate those yet statements. It, it answers half of them, but not the other half. So the client responded in a very favorable way to this scheme. The team also responded in a positive way. But now how do we, how do we, how do we satisfy these? There is no guarantee in this image that any of these are being satisfied. Once you've satisfied them, you end up with something more like this. And there are other considerations, for instance, being able to open windows and so forth. Um, the project is well under construction, and this is what it really looks like. It changes over the course of the day because it has a bit of a depth to, to the panels, and so it creates a, a, a different response to the lighting, depending on if it's morning or afternoon. Now, computer programming, it really informs computational design. And in the words of uh, someone who I found explains very well the underlying concepts of, or fundamentals of computer programming, um, Simon Allardyce, in one of his courses he says, every computer program is a series of instructions, a sequence of separate small commands, one after the other. Each instruction is telling the computer to do something very small, but very specific. The art of programming is to take a larger idea and break it apart into these individual steps. And I couldn't agree more with this statement. It really is true that if you want to take a design or any kind of abstract construct and you want to move it into the realm of computer programming, you can't do it without going through this experience, this process. And the more you do it, the better you become at it. So here's the crux of the presentation, uh, and this is where I try to get to as quickly as possible when I'm sharing this to someone who is brand new to the subject of computational design. How do you do that? How do you take these abstract? What is it that you like about this scheme or this alternative? What is essential? What is the design intent? And now how can you take that and break it down into individual pieces, a, an instruction, so to speak, and, and so that you're ready for to make it computational. So here are just a few of the essential elements that make the scheme a successful scheme, that if you lost these elements, it would no longer be successful. So one is to give it curvature in, in, instead of uh, um, being dominated by vertical lines to introduce this curvature that is, is it's really just moving away from the vertical line by adding these, this directionality in, in the horizontal. And then there's this calligraphic nature that you're taking the same curve and you're repeating it in the vertical, in the vertical direction. It's, it retains the essence or the success of the scheme. Then it's not the same uh, calligraphic ribbon repeated for each bay of the facade. It actually changes in elevation. It shifts vertically from bay to bay. And when you've retained these uh, essential elements, you're retaining the original character or the design intent of the facade. So it boils down to, to, to some of these. And then all, obviously the modularity is another essential part of it. So now you've seen before uh, these uh, visual, um, um, visual computer programs, these uh, visual algorithms. This is Grasshopper. I'm not going to talk about the whole algorithm. I'll just focus on a few parts. So when you look at the whole algorithm, it, it is a series of instructions. Um, but you can, you can introduce a sense of hierarchy. So you can take the whole problem, break it down to parts, and then those parts into smaller parts. So the first level of parts, let's call it that, um, the, first, the first step would be the calligraphy. The second step would be introducing the modularity. And the third step would be to identify the panel types. And then off to the side on the left, there's a series of variables. And th this is important to look at. There's a lot of thinking from uh, you know, lessons learned from um, uh, lean, lean design and lean construction that inform this process. So there is one, uh, one of the many uh, methods or approaches, which is called uh, set-based design. And this is um, uh, one way in which you can implement that approach to design uh, using a computational algorithm by creating option sets. When we talk about beyond BIM, in BIM, in, in Revit, and, and similar programs, when you're creating option sets, there isn't very much intelligence. Um, the, uh, you're, you, you're, it's really just automating the hiding and, and, and showing of different elements within the BIM model, but that's, that's as far as it goes. But when we're looking at option sets or alternatives, there are often parameters that are shared amongst, amongst options. 
there's hybrid versions and you want to say, I want part of, I want this from option A and this from option B, I'll make it B prime. Uh, that's very common in design, but there isn't an equivalent in it in the common BIM software. In computation, you can do this very easily, and that was handled at that variables section. So we go back to the diagrams that are a very simple way to describe or represent these essential elements that retain the character of the design. And they equate directly to specific, uh, let's call them micro steps or individual elements in the, in the algorithm. So here, uh, we're only taking the very initial part of the, of, of the algorithm and we're showing how the first parameter that is, composes an option set is this number uh, called scale x, scale in x. So when you change that number, it changes the amplitude of the curve. And there is a scale x for each of these options. So we're looking at four options. Each of these options are collecting three different parameters. Um, the next parameter is a vertical shift. That's another number that you can change. And that's uh, represented with the diagram there showing the calligraphy. And um, there's a third, there's a third uh, parameter called horizontal shift. That's the opacity. But we use that as a constant. And that's important, too, that you're able to lock in a constant. You can change the other variables, and you know that this constant will not change. Uh, this is something that, that is very explicit, very deliberate in computer programming and perhaps not so much so when you're the end user of a user interface for a, a BIM application, that you are declaring that something is constant. You can't change that value throughout the project. You can't overwrite it in computer programming, so to speak. So with these variables, we can combine different options. I showed you four, but there, we went through many more than that, 50, 60, who knows. Um, if you change the, one of the variables, which was for the uh, amplitude of curvature, you got different results. And, we, and we, we got the opinion of the client as well. Which one resonates with you most? Which one do you like more? Do you like more amplitude, less amplitude? Their answer was different than ours. It was important to know what it was. Um, but in all of the different possibilities that we looked at, we knew that the 60% opacity was, was respected. So here are the same option sets and you can go through them and you see how the, the result changes. Now the whole algorithm updates and you get more information or more model being generated from this, but you can always add new option sets, combine option sets, and not lose the work that you did before. This is part of what's commonly described as the power of uh, com computational design. It's also equally important to look at options that you know are unsuccessful because, as I said, you learn from comparing options side by side. So if you took this and you compared it to one that you know works, um, for instance, in, in this case, the, the resulting windows in between the concrete panels are too narrow in some rooms, and in other rooms they're too wide. And it's important for it to be able to make these comparisons to learn more about what, what needs to be done in the design process. So if we now take what immediately happens when you have these options and, and there are the diagrams that show the, the uh, amplitude of curvature and the calligraphy and whatnot. There are actually, there are actual, uh, there are actually s specific um, micro steps or what's called in grasshopper components that are responsible for representing those, those steps. So you can re it's, re it's very useful for to frame the problem in a logical procedural way because you will be able to um, represent them or develop them exactly as, as you had envisioned uh, that was once before abstract now becomes real in the model. The modularity looked this way when it was realized in the grasshopper model. As I mentioned, there's more to the model, not just those first initial steps, but there's also um, the ability to add more information such as now, now that we have this geometry, we can create the mullions um, the headers and the sills for the, the window walls. We can see the distribution of the different types and we can optimize that too. We can look into some detailing like adding some reveals onto the surface of the panels. We didn't go for this, but it was very easy for to, to represent it without losing the work that we had done. It's a lossless, you know, have you ever heard of lossy compression and lossless compression in, uh, in image processing? So if you have a, a JPEG, if you had a high-res photo 
and you, uh, and you uh, convert it into a JPEG, and the whole, the whole point of it was for it to have a f smaller file size, but it involves a lossy compression. So you actually lose information, you lose quality, you lose pixels. But then there's these other uh, compression, decompression codecs, uh, like TIFF, that have the option of, an, of a lossless compression, or Targa had that too in the video industry. And the, it was important for content uh, uh, creators to know this because with the lossy compression, you'll actually lose information. And if you, if you don't have the, the original, you've lost it for good. So that's just an analogy with image processing, but it's similar with computational design. You're creating an algorithm that enables you to explore design in a lossless way. You're not losing any work that you've done. You can always go back to what you had before. And one of the fundamental issues with, with BIM as it's presented now is that you start with a model, you're constantly changing it, you're modifying it, but you don't, you're not necessarily keeping track. You could be saving backups, I suppose, but not really. You have, you've changed your model. Your original is constantly changing. And what if there's something that you did four weeks ago that you would like to re-implement? It's possible that you've lost it and it would require an equal effort for to bring it back. That's something that you can completely avoid or almost completely avoid with computation. It's a different paradigm. Now that we have this information it, in, and you understand what's changing, what's constant, what's typical and what is varying, it makes documentation so much simpler. So usually for this kind of a system where there were 18 panel types, uh, but there were over 1,200 panels, and then there were also hundreds of, of uh, windows, architects would normally create 20, 30 sheets for to describe these panels and all their dimensions. But when you understand clearly what is constant and what is changing, you have full confidence. It's so easy for to document it. So 80% of the documentation for the panels is in one sheet. And I've only, uh, in, in, I started in 2012 there at uh, Perkins and Will, I was hearing that this panel discussion about the possibility of uh, the model being the, the deliverable. Well, I've, it, well it, it has mostly to do with my job description, but I've only produced uh, uh, 10 or less drawings in the past four years. But I felt like I've documented so much more than that because the documentation is really in the model. The, the, the investment of making the models intelligent is, is you're, you're kind of replicating or you're in a different way you're documenting your, your design. So my key points here, I'm finishing on time, is uh, that the computational tools are a medium for distilling design intent. I think that's the main key, po main, main key point in this presentation. And that's one example of how you can take a design intent in conversation with the author. In this case, it was Harley Grusko who authored that option. And coming to a common understanding of what is what really makes this option, you can distill it and represent it computationally. Computational tools reduce the, cert the uncertainty of rework. And I commented on that, on, on the lossless construct that computational design provides. By allowing designers to simultaneously explore or lock variables, thus providing more time for design. We can optimize prefab without compromising design intent. And prefabrication helps reduce uncertainty in design. Without computation, it already provides that benefit. But when you introduce computational design, this allows uh, further assurance to, trans this assurance to transcend design into construction. Um, and I'll take this last minute to talk about that, which is there are sp specific uh, considerations in the installation of the panels, for instance, the locations of the connections. And we simplify the locations of the connections to be at standard distances from column, column grids because we expected that if, if every single connection point was at, you know, this one's at 1,237 millimeters, this other one is at 2,503 millimeters, by having 1,000, you know, 4,000 different uh, locations, it would have uh, uh, created a much greater possibility of error, human error on site. So the computational model, 
it, part of its criteria was for to simplify the locations of the connections. And part of the shape of the panels is directly attributable to that, that thinking that was introduced as a, as a constraint in the model. So we can do that uh, not in a natural way in computational design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santiago. So, so with computational design, how do you see that, uh, obviously this is a large project, do you see that trickling down to, to smaller projects? We have, we have used it in, so we, we have used it in smaller projects. Um, this, the scalability of a computational workflow is not proportional, it's not proportionate to the square footage of a project. It's more proportionate, it's more proportionate to the complexity of the design and the, the quantity of different um, constraints. So you could have a very small project. Um, Van Dusen was a good example of that where you had uh, these very difficult to reconcile constraints. The project was only a, a few thousand square feet, but it was a, it was, there was a lot of complexity in, in that project. And, and we've worked on very large projects in the millions of square feet where the complexity was less than, than that project. So it, it has, I think, more to do with the, the, complex, the nature of the design itself. Yeah, right. very interesting. Great. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank really you. appreciate it. It was a great presentation.